Good morning. Um, this is John Rhodes, Chair of the Public Service Commission to Ord, um, and I'd like to call this session of the Public Service Commission to order with apologies for the 10-minute uh, logistical delay. Uh, Secretary Phillips, are there any changes to the final agenda? Good morning, Chair. Yes, there are several changes to the final agenda. We are pulling item 301A, item 301B, and item 378. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, and before we get started, I'd like to um, repeat my usual remarks. Um, and note our arrangements for session today. In line with the guidelines concerning social distancing and minimizing large gatherings, and in light of executive orders that suspend provisions of the open meetings law on an emergency basis, we are conducting today's session remotely. I'd like to remind those who are participating by phone to please mute your lines except when you are speaking. The public will have the opportunity to listen to the session on the department's webcast page. We will also record and transcribe the session as has been our practice. These arrangements have been reviewed by our general counsel, and he has found that these meet the, the requirements of the executive orders, and also that they meet my own expectations of honoring the intent of the open meeting law to the maximum extent permitted by our duty to protect the public health of New Yorkers. Um, and before moving to the agenda, uh, in keeping with this um, audio uh, format, uh, I would like to conduct a roll call of the commissioners. Uh, please confirm that you are with us when I call your name. Commissioner Diane Berman. I am here. Thank you. Commissioner Jim Alisi. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Tracy Edwards. I'm here. Good morning. Thank you. And Commissioner John Howard. I'm here as well, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, with that, we will uh, enter into the regular agenda. Um, the first item for discussion is um, item 201, cases 19E0378 et al., which are the electric and gas rates for NYSEG and RG&E, presented by Administrative Law Judge James Costello, Administrative Law Judge Michael Clark, Jeff Hogan, Deputy Director, Management and Operations Audit, and Tammy Mitchell, Director, Office of Gas uh, of Electric, Gas, and Water, are available for questions. Judge Costello, please begin. Good morning, Chairman Rhodes and Commissioners. Before you is a draft order that would establish electric and gas delivery rate plans for New York State Electric and Gas Corporation, or NYSEG, and Rochester Gas and Electric Corporation, or RG&E, which I will refer to together as the companies. The rate plans in the joint proposal cover three years running from April 17, 2020 through April 30, 2023. The rate plans would be based on the joint proposal filed in this case with certain modifications with respect to the company's electric businesses to bring total bill increases to approximately 2% or under for each rate year. I'm going to start with a brief background of the proceedings. The companies made their initial filings in May 2019 and filed updated and corrected testimony in August 2019. Department of Public Service staff and various other intervening parties filed testimony in September 2019. The companies, Department of Public Service staff and other intervener parties filed rebuttal testimony in October of 2019. On October 11, 2019, the companies filed a notice of impending settlement negotiations. In February of 2020, the companies submitted a letter stating that they had reached an agreement in principle with Department of Public Service staff and various other intervening parties and had begun working on a joint proposal. However, on March 7, 2020, Governor Cuomo declared a state of emergency due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Although the Public Utility Law Project of New York, which I'll refer to as PULP, and AARP New York requested that the companies be directed to provide new rate case data 
and supplemental testimony to address the economic impacts from the COVID-19 pandemic, the administrative law judges denied that request and granted the request by the companies, Department of Public Service staff, and multiple interveners to allow the parties to resume settlement negotiations to address the economic impacts arising from the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. On June 22, 2020, the companies filed the joint proposal under consideration. The joint proposal is signed in whole or in part by 23 parties representing diverse interests, including the companies, Department of Public Service staff, environmental groups, a labor union, individual ratepayers, and industrial, commercial, and institutional energy consumers. On August 6th of 2020, Judge Clark and I conducted an evidentiary hearing in which we received evidence into the record and allowed for cross-examination. The order before you would adopt the joint proposal, but with certain modifications that I will discuss later. And it will establish three-year rate plans for the company's electric and gas businesses that provide the companies with the revenues necessary to ensure, ensure they can provide safe, reliable, and adequate service, while also containing provisions that minimize impacts to the company's customers, particularly in light of the economic climate created by the COVID-19 pandemic. I will now turn to a brief discussion of the revenue increases for the gas businesses. The joint proposal's gas provisions contain modest rate increases overall and include forward-looking strategies designed to ensure the company's compliance with the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, or the CLCPA. Including the effects of shaping and levelization, NYSEG's gas delivery rates would be decreased by $514,000 in rate year one. After rate year one, NYSEG's rates are increased by $3.4 million in rate year two and increased by $5.3 million in rate year three. For an average residential gas heating customer consuming 90 therms per month, this would lead to a slight decrease in the monthly average bill in rate year one, an increase of 53 cents in rate year two, and an increase of $1.22 in rate year three. For RG&E gas, after shaping and levelization, delivery rates would be decreased by $1.1 million in rate year one. Rates are then increased by $0.9 million in rate year two, and by $3.9 million in rate year three. Under this plan, monthly average bills for average residential gas heating customers decrease by 80 cents in rate year one, followed by increases of 10 cents in rate year two, and by 81 cents in rate year three. Before turning to the electric revenue requirements, I wanna point out that the joint proposal contains innovative gas-related provisions that further New York's ambitious climate-related policy goals and that can serve as a model for future rate cases. These leading-edge gas provisions have garnered widespread support by the signatory parties and in public comments. The companies commit to achieving net zero growth in gas sales throughout their service territories during the term of the rate plans. They will discontinue all active promotion of natural gas service to reduce or eliminate gas expansion. The companies will also incentivize the expanded use of heat pumps and energy efficiency measures, pursue non-pipe alternatives, and use more electric and hybrid vehicles. In addition, the companies agree to forego further gas infrastructure investments, including investments in the De Ruyter and Lansing Freeville pipelines. The companies will submit a report to the commission analyzing how their businesses will evolve within the context of the CLCPA's express greenhouse gas reduction and renewable energy goals. The companies also will conduct a study on the potential depreciation impacts from the CLCPA on their gas, electric, and common assets. Turning to the company's electric businesses, the revenue increases for the electric businesses are more significant with the largest increases proposed for NYSIC electric customers. 
These increases are one reason why various environmental groups and some individuals who signed the joint proposal in support of the gas provisions did not sign the joint proposal in support of the electric provisions. However, increased revenues are necessary to address important issues such as NYSEG's ability to timely restore service and avoid outages caused by trees as its service territory is impacted by more frequent and severe storms. Also, as a result of the gas provisions of the joint proposal that address climate change issues, usage is expected to shift away from natural gas, resulting in increased demands on the electric system, which requires investments for maintenance, reliability, and growth. Recognizing these needs, various intervening parties representing different customer classes have signed on to the electric provisions of the joint proposal. Under the terms of the joint proposal, NYSEC's electric delivery revenues would be increased by $45.7 million in rate year one, $84.8 million in rate year two, and $88.6 million in rate year three. However, out of concern for the size of the increases, especially given the economic impacts from COVID-19, the proposed order modifies those revenue increases. Thus, under the order's rate plan, NYSEG's electric delivery revenues would be increased by $45.3 million in rate year one, $45.6 million in rate year two, and $36 million in rate year three. With those modifications, monthly bills for typical residential customers would increase by $2.48 in rate year one, $1.84 in rate year two, and $2.42 in rate year three. The total customer bill increases company-wide for the electric businesses would be approximately 2% for each rate year. I'm sorry, for NYSEG company, uh, electric company businesses. Under the terms of the joint proposal, RG&E's electric delivery revenues as levelized in shape would be increased by $15.2 million in rate year one, $28.1 million in rate year two, and $30.7 million in rate year three. However, the proposed order would modify those increases to $21.4 million in rate year one, $13.9 million in rate year two, and $15.8 million in rate year three. With those modifications, monthly bills for typical residential customers at RG&E would increase by $1.20 in rate year one, $1.95 in rate year two, and $2.26 in rate year three. The total customer bill increases would be approximately 1.6% in rate year one, 2% in rate year two, and 2% in rate year three. It is important to note that even with the increases just mentioned, the company's electric delivery rates would be amongst the lowest in New York State. To lower the amount of the electric rate increases, the proposed order modifies the joint proposal as follows. First, the collections for the company's electric energy efficiency and heat pump programs are being capped at the level proposed in the joint proposal for rate year one. Second, the grid model enhancement project will be capitalized rather than expensed. Third, NYSEC Electric will use additional excess depreciation reserve in rate year two and rate year three. In rate year two, that amount will go from 34.95 million to 38.95 million, and in rate year three, the amount will go from 39.1 million to 71.6 million. Fourth, the amortization period for the Vegetation Management Danger Tree Program will be 10 years for each, year, each rate year's expense, rather than the five years proposed in the joint proposal. For NYSE Electric, rather than being expensed, the Vegetation Management Reclamation Program will be amortized over a 10-year period in the same manner as the Danger Tree Program costs. Finally, for RG and E Electric, the shaping levelization of rates is modified 
which makes the rate increases higher in rate year one and significantly lower in rate years two and three. The draft order establishes rates based on a return on equity of 8.8% and a 48% common equity ratio. The 8.8% return on equity includes a stay out premium and also reflects additional risks to the company for greater imputed productivity savings. The return on equity is lower than the company's current return on equity of 9% and is equivalent to or lower than the return on equity provided to other electric and gas utilities in recent rate cases. It is important to note that the joint proposal for return on equity was arrived at in consideration of the Commission's generic finance methodology and that Department of Public Service staff has indicated that any post-COVID update to its litigated position likely would have increased its return on equity recommendation. The rate plans also include an earnings sharing mechanism enabling customers to receive the benefit of any additional earnings beyond the company's allowed return. In addition to the modifications I mentioned earlier, several provisions in these rate plans are in, de in direct response to the current economic crisis brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic and all parties to the joint proposal should be commended for their efforts in this regard. The rate plans include an emergency financial relief program to provide immediate assistance to the most financially insecure customers. Specifically, the rate plans create a $30 million customer benefit that can provide a one-time bill credit of $100 to vulnerable residential and small business customers. The bill credit will be available immediately to the company's low income discount program participants and customers with minimum payment deferred payment agreements. Additionally, the credits will be offered in three phases so that customers who did not qualify in phase one may become eligible in phase two or three. The companies have also suspended disconnections and related charges such as late payment and reconnect fees residential customer deposits and same day turn on fees. These suspensions will remain in effect until a date that will be, will be determined in consultation with Department of Public Service staff and the commission. The companies will continue their arrears forgiveness program within the low income programs through funding of $1.5 million at NYSIG and $1.1 million at RG&E. And they will extend low income program eligibility to customers who are HEAP eligible but have been denied a grant for lack of available funding. The joint proposal allows for more flexible deferred payment agreements, given the, giving the companies more flexibility to address individual situations as their customers continue to experience the economic impacts of the pandemic while continuing to need these essential utility services. The joint proposal creates a COVID-19 economic development program providing funds for small business and large business customers focused on economic recovery and retention projects necessitated by the pandemic. Under the joint proposal, the companies will delay implementation of the grid model enhancement project to rate year two, and they have delayed the in-service dates of more than 30 other projects reflected 25% lower collection related costs in rate year one, reduced non-essential travel budgets by 20% in rate year one, reduced inflation and debt rates for all three years, delayed implementation of advanced metering infrastructure or AMI deployment by 12 months and information technology by six to 12 months. In addition, the company's superstorm deferral amortization has been changed from five years to 10 years. Together, these pandemic-related revenue reductions amount to approximately $98.9 million during the three rate years. Furthermore, as the signatory parties recognize, these provisions can be modified or expanded as necessary in the Commission's generic COVID-19 proceeding in Case 20-M-0266. Last, while the rate plans provide for the closure of six customer service walk-in offices, 
five of the officers are among those that have the lowest levels of customer service transactions, and one office is being closed for security concerns. Further, in recognition of COVID-19, the closures are being delayed you want to go out and will the front not door? begin. Come on. I'm sorry, can I just ask everyone who's not speaking to please put their phones on mute? So in recognition of COVID-19, the closures are being delayed and will not begin until at least June 2021, and any planned closures will be reevaluated before closure for any offices that experience a material increase in customer traffic. For those offices that are closed, the rate plans provide for a process for customers to request an in-person meeting with a customer service employee as needed. Some background is necessary to understand what is driving the rate increases in this case. Both companies have been operating on a very lean basis, especially NYSEG, which has experienced decreased reliability in recent years. For example, in case 19-M-0285, after investigating NYSEG's response to several storms in the winter and spring of 2018, DPS staff recommended that NYSEG increase its overhead line resources by 100 to 150 full-time equivalents. In addition, both companies were subject to penalties for their response to those storms, with NYSEG agreeing to pay $9 million and RG&E $1.5 million in penalties, which are being used to offset the revenue requirements in these rate plans. Under the rate plans, at a time when unemployment has been increasing in many sectors, the companies will be providing jobs by adding 522 full-time equivalent employees between January 2019 and April 2023. 456 full-time equivalent employees will be added to the company's electric businesses, including the 150 linemen and 55 apprentice linemen, which are needed for reliability and storm response. Despite these employee level increases, the rate plans include generous productivity adjustments of 1.5% in rate year one and 2% in both rate year two and rate year three to help offset the rate increases. These adjustments are higher than the 1% productivity adjustment typically applied by the commission in rate proceedings. Finally, to ensure the customers only pay for employees that are actually hired, the rate plans have a downward only labor expense reconciliation mechanism. For reliability purposes, it is also critical that the companies invest in plant to replace maintain and upgrade an electric system that is older than the average system in New York. The majority of the increases in electric revenues over the three or eight years are due to additional plant investment. Over the course of the rate plans, there will be $1.6 billion of investment in NYSIG's electric system and $871 million of investment in RG&E's electric system. This represents a 72% increase over the 2016 to 2018 spending level for NYSEG and a 34% increase for RG&E. The capital spending will be used for reliability and resiliency with an increased focus on equipment replacement and substation work, required upgrades to the bulk electric system that increase reliability and system performance, further work on the Rochester area reliability projects to strengthen the existing transmission system by building an additional bulk power station, non-AMI distributed system implementation plan grid automation, and advanced metering infrastructure implementation. For NYSEG Electric, the largest category of investment is in mandatory projects, which are necessary due to the statutory regulatory code, and industry standard requirements. On the gas side, in addition to capital spending to maintain and upgrade the system and for AMI implementation, capital is being spent on leak-prone pipe replacement, which will lower greenhouse gas emissions and have a positive impact on the environment. These increased expenditures from capital investments and labor costs are expected to have a positive impact on the economy 
for areas of the state that desperately need such a boost during this difficult time. Distribution vegetation management is one of the issues raised by various parties during the course of this rate plan, with many people advocating that NYSIG Electric should be given funding to bring it to a full five-year trim cycle. Because of the increased costs that would be involved resulting in yet larger rate increases, the rate plan before you would not bring NYSIG to a full five-year trim cycle, although it is expected to bring substantial progress toward reaching that goal in the future. As such, the rate plan increases NYSIG's distribution vegetation management budget from the current $30 million per year to a total of $57 million per year. That increased amount includes $17 million for reclamation of circuits that have either not been trimmed in over five years or have been identified as circuits that have experienced reliability issues. The rate plan also includes $10 million per year for a danger tree program for NYSIG to address trees that are likely to result in electric outages. To better align the benefits of the program with its costs and to moderate rate impacts, the danger tree program costs are being phased into the revenue requirements and otherwise deferred for later recovery. Given the large increase in distribution vegetation management costs, NYSIG is required to hire an external monitor to provide review and oversight of its program. The distribution vegetation management program for NYSIG places reliability concerns at the forefront and balances the need to bring NYSIG closer to a five, full five-year trim cycle with the need to mitigate bill impacts. The proposed order includes funding for the company's estimated five-year costs of $489.1 million in capital expenditures for the implementation of AMI across all four businesses. The AMI benefit cost analysis in the record supports implementation of AMI which will allow customers access to new tools and information to effectively manage and reduce electric and gas usage, establish new markets to promote the implementation of low carbon distributed energy resources, and improve service restoration times. Operational savings through changes in business operations and reductions in capital purchases also support implementation of AMI. The AMI plan is reasonable and properly included as part of these rate plans. Another rate driver in these cases is the fact that the companies have experienced decreases in forecasted sales revenues, which creates a need for higher rates to cover costs. On the other hand, the rate plans include various funds to help lower rates. For example, the company's revenue requirements pass back to customers benefits that resulted from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 in the amounts of approximately $61 million for NYSIG Electric, $31 million for RG&E Electric, $13.7 million for NYSIG Gas, and $8.9 million for RG&E Gas. The rate plans would increase the company's low-income program budgets to approximately $21 million for NYSIG, and $17 million for RG&E due to anticipated higher enrollments. Current discount levels with monthly discount levels ranging from $3 to $36 will remain the same for our rate year one and will be reviewed and adjusted as necessary in rate years two and three. Low income discount participants will continue to receive needed assistance. On average, the $100 bill credit discussed earlier will offset approximately 70% of the rate increases a typical NYSIG low-income discount program customer would experience, and over 90% of the rate increases a typical RG&E low-income customer would experience during the term of the rate plans. The companies will expand community, agency, and municipal outreach to notify customers of potential bill assistance that is available. Companies have committed to additional protections for residential customers during cold weather periods and heat advisories. And they have also agreed to conduct a study to identify potential partnerships for senior customer outreach concerning energy efficiency opportunities, low income discounts, 
and other senior customer-related opportunities. Under the proposed rate plans, the customer's service performance targets are either made more stringent or are kept the same as those currently in place for the companies. An arrears component is added to the terminations and uncollectibles incentive, and the incentive targets have been tightened. Also, the system reliability performance targets would be continued by the rate plans. In addition, the electric rate plans added a new distribution line inspection program and associated targets designed to incentivize the companies to eliminate their backlog of level two deficiencies, which are electric system conditions that are likely to fail prior to the next inspection cycle and that represent a safety or reliability threat should a failure occur prior to repair. For gas safety metrics, both companies are implementing a more aggressive leak management program and damage prevention targets, as well as the gas safety violations performance metric that is modified to be consistent with a metric applied to other utilities. The proposed rate plans will increase fixed customer charges for the company's electric and gas businesses. Various, various parties direct opposition mainly to the proposed changes to the residential fixed customer charges for electric service. The monthly residential customer charges for NYSIG of $15.11 and for RG&E of $21.38 have been in place since 2010 and will remain in place during rate year one. The customer charges for the residential service classes will increase at NYSIG to $16.05 in rate year two and $17 in rate year three and at RG&E to $21.70 in rate year two and $22 in rate year three. Even with the increases to the electric customer charges, those customer-related costs remain below the cost of service. The relatively modest increase in fixed customer charges do not undermine the cost signals that are provided by the volumetric delivery charges and will not interfere with the state's energy efficiency goals. So in evaluating the terms of a joint proposal, the Commission must determine whether the joint proposal considered as a whole produces a result that is in the public interest. In doing so, the Commission considers whether the terms of the joint proposal are consistent with the environmental, social, and economic policies of the Commission and the State, whether they produce results within the range of outcomes that might result if the issues in the case were fully litigated, and whether they appropriately balance the interests of the utilities, ratepayers, and investors, and the long-term viability of the utilities. The Commission also looks at whether the record is complete and the extent to which the settlement is contested. In these cases, the parties had full notice and opportunity to make their views known in both the litigated and settlement tracks of the proceedings, both before and after the onset of the COVID-19 crisis. And we have a full record with testimony and exhibits submitted by various parties. The rate plans, electric and gas provisions are joined by various parties with different and often opposing interests. Although the gas provisions have broader support, opposition to the electric provisions rests largely on the size of the proposed rate increases and on different opinions as to how the collected funds should be spent. While other valid choices could have been advanced by the signatory parties to the joint proposal, we believe that the rate plans with the modifications made in the proposed order mitigate rate impacts to the extent practicable and strike an appropriate balance between the interests of ratepayers and the long-term viability of the companies. The rate plans provide immediate relief from the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, enable needed and mandatory infrastructure improvements, enhance distribution vegetation management programs to improve system reliability, resiliency, and safety, and institute fundamental changes to the company's natural gas businesses in furtherance of the aggressive goals established by the CLCPA. The signatory parties to the joint proposal took significant steps to defer expenses where appropriate and to mitigate the effect of necessary expenses through the levelization and shaping of rates modification of amortization periods, the use of excess depreciation reserve balances to address rate compression, and the use of other regulatory assets as offsets. The modifications 
in the proposed order take further steps to reduce rate impacts. The rate plans benefit rate payers by including an earnings sharing mechanism, various downward only reconciliation mechanisms, and negative revenue adjustments if the companies miss established targets for certain customer service, electric reliability, and gas safety performance metrics. Rate plans contain various programs and initiatives that further reforming the energy vision policies. They provide for energy efficiency, heat pump and electric vehicle programs, and promote non-wire and non-pipe alternatives to electric or gas capital investments where appropriate and cost effective. The rate plans include earnings, adjustment mechanisms related to energy efficiency and system efficiency, including targets for the reduction of system peak demand for load factor improvement and to increase the use of distributed energy resources. The implementation of AMI in the company service territories also will result in benefits to ratepayers. Based upon the testimony filed by the parties, the terms of the proposed rate plans could reasonably have been expected to result from the parties' litigated positions or provide benefits that could not have been achieved within the context of litigation. The draft order before you has strived to be faithful to the actions and priorities agreed to in the joint proposal, and to the extent there are changes, they are only related to the timing of collections from customers. The provisions of the proposed rate plans resulting from the joint proposal with modifications will allow the companies to continue the provision of safe and adequate service and take into consideration the needs of customers as they manage the economic effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. The proposed rate plans are in the public interest and we recommend that they be adopted as stated in the draft order. This concludes my, re my presentation and advisory staff, Judge Clark and I, are available for any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Judge Costello. Um, it's obviously it's John Rhodes speaking. Um, uh, to me, this is an important and responsible step. With this, we would authorize and focus the companies on the most important investments, expenditures, and activities carefully determined to best serve the needs of the utilities customers, notably affordability, reliability, an achievement of the state's energy policies, even in these uh, challenging times. This set of investments and expenditures and activities was developed in a joint proposal in an evidence-based um, and inclusive process with highly engaged parties and ultimately um, with a broad set of representative signatories. Uh, the order reflects some narrow modifications to the joint proposal that preserve uh, the intent um, and investments and planned achievements of that JP while appropriately managing the final financial impacts on customers. Um, I commend the work that went into this and I will be voting in favor. Um, I now turn to my colleague commissioners uh, for any comments or questions that they may have, beginning with Commissioner Berman. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, generally, when I um, speak at session, I am not nervous. Um, I have had time to look at a matter and then to carefully weigh how I may or may not vote. I take my job very seriously, as do all the other commissioners. We have a broad mandate to ensure that consumers receive safe and reliable utility service at reasonable rates and with the least adverse effect upon the environment. Our commission stands at the crossroads of the public need for virtually essential core services and the private needs of the shareholder to ensure continued investment in these services. As such, this occupies an incredibly important and unique role for us in balancing these interests in a way that ensures the most advanced and reliable services while at the same time ensuring they are effectively and efficiently delivered. Critical importance of our commission's mission to the, is to the economic well-being of the state and its citizens, and that can't be overstated. 
I am nervous speaking today because I am uncomfortable with the regulatory rate process as it relates to NYSIG specifically, but our rate cases in general as we go forward. I've spoken for the last several years about my concerns about uh, both internally and publicly about my concerns on where we are in how we are handling rate cases, how we are dealing with our public policy goals and incorporating them in a way that is really um, appropriate and understandable and providing regulatory certainty. I note that I know that we are in general looking at uh, capital plans on uh, wires, capital plans on utilities in general that have been submitted for supporting the CLCPA. And looking at them, it's clear it will require in the future huge rate increases um, to deal with those things and to accommodate our CLCPA goals, EVs, et cetera. I also am looking at um, our increasing um, public policies that are uh, valid, um, that are noble, but that are not necessarily taking the time to look at the impact uh, short and long term on the costs. It really is important. We have to, we, there's a more cautious outlook economically due to the lingering COVID impact. There's looming uncertainty as we head into 2021, 2022, et cetera. Reliability is critical. Uh, NERC came out with a, a winter reliability assessment the other day that showcases the need for us to take seriously, especially in the Northeast and New England in particular, on uh, the growing uncertainty um, with our preparedness. For me, I think that um, in my role as a regulator, um, as a regulator, that I am growing and I am now uncomfortable with voting for this rate case. It is not that I don't think staff did a good job and think, in fact, I think staff has worked tirelessly to try to make very strategic and important um, decisions on with the uh, focus on um, uh, helping the ratepayers on this huge impact. However, I don't think the process has been a good one. In fact, I think it's been very much herky-jerky, not only on whether the item was or was not on, not only on giving things internally um, in a way that didn't provide for me personally an opportunity to really weigh in and get under the hood. But I feel that we are shooting from the hip on what our standards are as it relates to dealing with COVID in these rate cases. This is going to be the first major rate case decided during this time in a way that is speaking directly to making changes to the joint proposal because of the COVID-19 impact. Therefore, I think it takes a really important uh, amount of dedicated time, not just in asking staff to sharpen their pencils, but to work with all relevant stakeholders, including the commissioners, to take a fair and balanced look at this rate case. All interested parties should have had an opportunity to submit input on the issues as part of the record. It is the record that drives our decision making. We need the record to be able to support whatever we decide to do. And we need to make sure that there are not outside influences on pushing us in a direction if the record does not support that. As I look at this, I see that there are many issues that we are not carefully developing. The evidentiary record is not there. It may be that the result itself is a sound one. The result itself could have been supported by an evidentiary record. However, after the joint proposal was filed, um, there was no engagement on the record to ensure that, that what we were doing would be supported by the record itself. Even if it is supported by it sounds good, 
top-down decision making may be there, we do need to make sure that we're making decisions based on that. This is not a productive development of how we may handle other rate cases. In fact, for me, what is notable is that this joint proposal was filed on June 22nd, 2020, in the middle of the COVID crisis. And yes, at that time, many of us, myself included, were hoping that we, this would be a short-lived um, pandemic and it's had a much more longer life shelf and then we continue to deal with these ramifications. However, that joint proposal did look with 23 parties representing diverse interests, looked at the impacts and what we may do from a COVID perspective. Very thoughtful, very engaged. And yet we sat on that joint proposal. We did not officially come together and to talk about what it was that we were looking for further to fine tune that. We did not open it back up to ask those who had taken the time to look at that joint pro proposal to come together, even if it was on limited issues that we wanted to uh, focus on. For me, I am very cognizant of the fact that we also have ongoing generic proceedings that have not been decided, and yet they are timely to be decided including the gas planning matter, including relevant studies um, that we've asked to be undertaken, including looking at um, resource adequacy, including looking at the COVID-19 impacts. All of those things in those records could have also been somehow shared with us in a way that would give us information for the record in this case to feel comfortable that we were making a decision not just based on what, what the staff um, felt was important, but really was a fair and balanced um, decision based on the evidentiary record itself. I am looking for us as we move forward to figure out where it is that we need to fix what I see as a process problem that is leading to huge potential substantive issues. Um, I myself wanna roll up my sleeves and help figure it out in a way that makes us move forward in a positive way. I have spoken to our finance staff on the concerns I have with the market analysts and some of the um, outlooks and ratings um, projections that they've done. I would ask um, Doris to speak a little bit about uh, some of what we've talked about, especially as it relates to NYSIG in general. Moody's put out in September 2020 a uh, outlook that talked about um, moving NYSIG and RG&E to negative. And reading that ratings analysis and rationale, it concerns me. I am concerned that this movement today on resolving the rate case, while that may in some corners appear to be a positive because it is resolving a uh, outstanding item that needs to be resolved. Based on my reading of Moody's um, analysis, I'm not sure that they would move off of their negative rating and in fact, we're playing right into the rationales that led them to have concerns with um, this negative rating. Uh, so I'd like Doris to speak about it uh, just because I think it is that important for folks to truly understand how our actions um, can negatively or positively impact the market. So um, good morning, this is Doris Stout. And um, as Commissioner Berman indicated, we've had some conversations on this and um, bond ratings analyses are quite complex. So I'm gonna apologize up front for the length of my answer, but there's really no quick answer um, to the concerns being raised. Um, to evaluate the potential reaction of the rating agencies 
we have to consider two key aspects. One is the quantifiable impacts, the financial impact of our actions, including the impact on earnings and cash flows, and the other being the non-quantifiable or qualitative impacts of our actions on the perceived regulatory environment. And those um, potential impacts need to be gauged within the context of the company's existing ratings, including the parent company's ratings. And also, you know, we have this overlying impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, which adds some additional uncertainty um, to the analysis. Um, both S&P and Moody's rate NYSIG and rg and &E in the low A rating category. The two companies are rated A- minus by S&P, A3 by Moody's. Uh, S&P has the companies with a stable outlook, whereas Moody's has a negative outlook on the company, as Commissioner Berman indicated. So, um, and both S&P and Moody's rate Avant Grid, NYSIG, and rg &E's parent in the triple B plus or BAA1 category, which is one notch below what the NYSIG and rg &E ratings are. Um, all of those ratings are investment grade. Um, and um, again, with the uh, Avant Grid, um, S&P is rating uh, Avant Grid stable in its category, and Moody's is also negative for Avon Grid. So um, the two rating agencies have, you know, different perspectives. And in March 2020, S&P found that the regulatory environment in New York is generally constructive. Um, S&P specifically noted benefits from our forward test year and revenue decoupling. And at that time, S&P stated that a settlement in principle had been reached in the rate case and found that the company's management of its regulatory risk to be in line with peers. And S&P expected the company to continue to be able to effectively manage that regulatory risk. And Moody's, you know, similarly has recognized New York's suite of credit-friendly cost recovery provisions, such as multi-year plans like this one use of a fully forward test year and revenue decoupling mechanisms. However, despite these positive factors, Moody, Moody's currently recognizes and categorizes New York as having what it considers credit negative regulatory developments. Um, in a report issued on Friday, Moody's lists various developments in New York that have created negative credit implications over the past 12 months, including the NYSIG rg &E rate case, noting that the companies have negative outlooks due to the joint proposal that backloads rate increases and results in sustainably weaker financial metrics. Moody's changed its outlook for NYSIG and rg &E to negative in September. The negative outlook was based on the potential for financial metric deterioration, specifically with regards to cash flow under the joint proposal, as well as the beginning stages of limitations on natural gas investments, which are about 20% of the utilities business. Uh, Moody specifically noted that if the cash flow is forecast to stay at a lower level over the three years of the rate plan, it could lead to a downgrade. So, therefore, I believe, you know, that given these Moody statements about backloading the increases and the cash flows under the original joint proposal, as well as its categorization with a negative outlook, that the modifications proposed to the joint proposal, which further push cost recovery to later years, could add to the pressure on the company's cash flow metrics, and it would increase the likelihood of a potential downgrade. This would bring NYSIG and rg &E's bond ratings to BAA1 and consistent with their parent Avon Grids rating, and that would still be investment grade, so they should still have good access to capital, but at a slightly higher cost. 
Um, S&P's analysis uh, is a little harder to read. Um, their analysis uh, specifically on NYSIG and RGE is from March 2020. Um, and they currently have had, had NYSIG RGE with a stable outlook because they considered the regulatory environment in New York as generally constructive. But in a more recent report, S&P indicated that it had looked at the regulatory jurisdictions, including New York, and it indicated it was monitoring developments surrounding the heightened political scrutiny in New York to determine whether or not it could negatively impact credit quality of the utilities in the state. So it's a little harder for me to say, you know, where S&P's ratings might go for the company. Um, but overall, I think, you know, as Commissioner Berman indicated, it's a, it's a question of balance. And the commission should weigh the long-term cost of a potential downgrade against the benefits of constraining the rate increases during the economic crisis of COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you so much, Doris. That was very helpful. Um, where I land is I am going to vote no on this item. I am, as I said, very um, concerned and uh, nervous um, about our regulatory actions and what would give me comfort in being able to vote for this um, in what I do believe is a good faith effort on the part of the staff and the company in trying to balance those interests fails because we are not um, relying on the evidentiary record and we're not um, utilizing the generic proceedings on many of these items um, that uh, were supposed to help us formulate um, uh, more regulatory certainty and, and give us uh, and give stakeholders information on um, how we would be dealing with these um, uh, public policy considerations and economic um, si situations. So I'm a no, thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Berman, and also thank you, Doris. Um, Commissioner Alisi. Good morning, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I believe that this is a sensible approach, uh, especially in today's world. Um, it provides immediate relief uh, with modifications to low-income programs, uh, redesigning capital plans, uh, reformatting uh, investment decision-making. It displays an awareness of the needs of small business, uh, provides a positive impact on the environment. Uh, overall, I think the joint proposal does serve the public interest with regards to the environment, society, the economy, and I believe it does balance the needs uh, of uh, rate payers as well as investors. So I will be supporting it. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Edwards. Uh, yes, thank you. I wanna thank you, uh, Judge Costello and Judge Clark and the staff. And, you know, I, uh, and thank you, Doris. I, I think that you articulated, you know, really uh, what is in front of us in terms of of bond rating and, and for the company. And that definitely has to be considered. But it's one piece of the puzzle. We have to look at the consumer's ability to pay, how to continue our efforts on CLCPA, how to continue to improve safety measures like is being done here in terms of the increasing the metrics on leak management program. Uh, adding jobs in this unprecedented time to focus on storm recovery. Uh, it is a very balanced approach. We are in unprecedented times. It's very difficult. So I want to commend all of you for putting this forward. The efforts to minimize the impact on low income customers, the focus on economic recovery for business customers also should be commended. There is no perfect way right now. Everyone is doing the very best that they can. 
Uh, so I am, uh, I have no hesitation to, uh, to vote in favor of this. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this case uh, is the first one that uh, my term, during my term as a commissioner that I've seen from its initial filing to now uh, producing orders. Uh, I attended uh, public statement hearings uh, when we could in person and then subsequently remotely. Uh, I must say that the initial size of, of these electric cases uh, increases request um, and the subsequent settlement uh, gave me great pause. And that was before the impact of COVID-19. Uh, While I agree to an extent with Commissioner Berman's comment on process, uh, I feel that the end result is vastly improved. I still have many concerns with aspects of this order, particularly issues regarding uh, the advanced metering initiative. I'm pleased to see that it is somewhat postponed and I would hope that uh, we will be able to, again, keep our pencils very sharp uh, because uh, as of now, I uh, remain skeptical about the many aspects of the AMI initiative. Uh, while I wish we were in the position to freeze or even lower electric rates, uh, I know that is impossible. And in this case, sometimes parties need a deadline to reach a settlement. And to this case, uh, the closer we got today, the more reasonable the outcome became for uh, rate payers. Um, In regards to the gas case, uh, I want to applaud those involved uh, with this, quite honestly, uh, very present uh, setting uh, initiative. Uh, and that recognizing that the way we had done gas uh, cases in the past and how companies approached it uh, has changed dramatically and abandoning particularly the concept of build it and they will come philosophy of, of pipelines uh, on the distribution system, uh, I think is this outcome we're well served with that. Uh, I maintain that many of the new technologies that we are trying to do in this case and across the board in the state of New York should not be borne solely on the backs of the rate paying public. And it is my sincere, sincere hope that in 2021, we'll see a far greater role for the federal tax code and the federal budget to help New Yorkers and all Americans invest in our new energy future. With those comments uh, being said, uh, I will be supporting this in this, these orders. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, with that, I will proceed to call for a vote. Um, for the record, this is John Rhodes, and my vote is in favor of the recommendations to adopt the terms of the joint proposal with modifications as discussed. Commissioner Berman, how do you vote? No. Commissioner Alisi, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Edwards, how do you vote? I vote in favor. Commissioner Howard, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you all. Um, the item is approved and the recommendation is adopted. We will now um, proceed to the now second item for discussion, um, which uh, Secretary Phillips, I believe is item 302, cases 20E0588 and 20E0587, is that correct? That is correct. Thank you very much. Uh, these cases are investigations into consolidated Edison's 2009, July 2019 outages in Manhattan and in Brooklyn, presented by Joseph Such, Director, Office of Investigations and Enforcement. 
Kevin Wisely, Director of the Office of Resilience and Emergency Preparedness, Kim Canty, Acting Deputy Director, Office of Accounting, Audits and Finance, and John Sykos, Deputy General Counsel, are available for questions. Joe, please begin. Good morning, Chair Roads and Commissioners. Item 302 is a proposed order instituting a proceeding at the show cause relating to two July 2019 outages occurring in the Manhattan and Brooklyn service territories of Consolidated Edison of New York Incorporated, which also referred to here as Con Edison. In short, the proposed order directs Con Edison to show cause why the commission should not commence a review of the prudency of its outage actions, why the commission should not pursue civil penalties, and why Con Edison should not implement the department's remedial recommendations provided in the accompanying staff outage report. This item 302, along with items 303 and 266, currently before the commission, are the second set of proposed orders coming from the department's new Office of Investigations and Enforcement formed earlier this year. During the summer of 2019, Con Edison experienced two sizable outage events eight days apart. Neither were storm related. The first occurred on Manhattan's west side on the evening of Saturday, July 13, 2019, emptying numerous theaters and restaurants of their patrons. This nearly five hour outage caused approximately 73,000 customers to lose electric service from Fifth Avenue to the Hudson River and from 31st Street to 71st Street. The second outage, a two day event, occurred in the Flatbush area of Brooklyn on July 21st through 22nd, 2019, and resulted in the loss of electric service of approximately 33,000 customers. Immediately after the outages, the department initiated an investigation of Con Edison's preparation for and response to these events. Staff investigation focused on, among other things, the technical root causes and remedial measures for each outage and considered whether Con Edison complied with the public service law, its commission approved emergency response plan or EIP, the outage notification incentive mechanism and commission regulations and audits. Staff also evaluated whether Con Edison's actions were prudent. The department's 13 month investigation included interviews, requesting and reviewing thousands of pages of technical and business documents, numerous stakeholder discussions, and an examination of Con Edison's communication efforts to customers, emergency personnel, and government officials and the media. The department also leveraged external experts in its technical evaluation. The results of the department's investigation are memorialized in a 104 page outage report, which is provided to the commission contemporaneously with this proposed order. The outage report report identifies that the outages were the result of apparently foreseeable relay failures for Manhattan, inadequate load shedding and restoration procedures for Brooklyn. The proposed order requires Con Edison to show cause why it should not implement the 84 corrective actions commenced in the staff report. The proposed order also reflects the eight apparent EIP violations and four apparent ONIM violations identified in the investigation, which include inadequate and untimely outage press releases, briefings, and other communications to customers and government officials, and inaccurate and vague estimated times of restorations. These apparent violations, if confirmed by the commission, may total more than $25 million in penalties. In addition to these potential penalties, the commission has already assessed and applied $15 million in negative revenue adjustments to Con Edison in relation to these outages per the, per the terms of their rate case order. The proposed order requires Con Edison also to show cause whether it acted prudently during the outages. Lastly, should the commission confirm any of the apparent violations in this proposed order, it may then, in combination with other admitted or confirmed violations, of Con Edison's failure to provide safe and adequate service, move to commence a proceeding to consider the revocation or modification of Con Edison's certificate to operate. 
As such, the department recommends the commission adopt the proposed order, instituting a proceeding and to show cause. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your consideration, and the team is available for questions. Thank you, Joe. Um, this, uh, this item is the product of um, careful probing and expert investigation into notable and highly customer impactful blackouts um, at Con Ed last year's. Uh, these blackouts um, and the associated problematic uh, restoration and communications um, aftermath uh, had causes, and we now know what those causes were, and we understand the failures behind those causes. Uh, this order um, takes us in, to an important next step via uh, the order to show cause as you described. Next steps both towards prevention of occurrence and towards accountability, accountability for performance by this utility. Um, I am going to be in favor of this item. Uh, Commissioner Berman. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to save most of my comments for item 303, even though some of the comments that I will raise um, will um, perhaps apply to 302. However, um, I'm going to just focus on one issue right now, or actually two issues. Um, the first is you mentioned that there were um, outside experts uh, could you share sort of the process with those um, outside folks? How many? How did they get selected? Um, what what exactly did they work on? And um, what was um, uh, what was the amount of money spent to hire um, these folks? Thank you, Commissioner. I'll ask John Cyples to address that question. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioner Berman. This is uh, John Sipos. Good morning, Commissioners. Can you hear me uh, all right? Yes, we can, John. Go ahead. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, appreciate that. Um, so, so good morning, uh, John Sipos. Uh, and Commissioner Berman, to your question, um, the process regarding the um, outside external independent panel members and their selection, um, shortly after uh, the first and then also after the second outage, um, there was a uh, recognition um, uh, of the uh, significance of those outages and the need to uh, um, have a uh, thorough evaluation and investigation of that. And as a result of that, um, um, uh, 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 NIFA um, offered uh, some assistance and through a, you know, an informal agreement um, and, uh, um, to promote the public interest and to protect the electrical power system and to provide you know, timely assistance in this unplanned uh, outage um, regarding various electrical systems. Um, you know, it was appropriate to um, accept that offer and uh, staff at the Department of Public Service evaluated various outside individuals um, for, uh, for their um, fit and you know, um, assistance on the investigation. And the process was much like uh, the process that would be for hiring an expert uh, for a, um, a litigation matter. Um, and at the end of the process, uh, and, and, and the evaluation of those um, you know, candidates uh, was done in conjunction with OEGW, um, uh, Office of uh, Resilience and Emergency Services, and also the Office of General Counsel, um, and issues uh, and the criteria for uh, examination included, you know, potential conflicts of interest, um, but also expertise of the individuals, um, the objective analysis uh, that they might have, uh, their availability uh, to assist in the investigation, um, which we wanted to start, you know, very, very rapidly, um, and also, you know, any other commitments that they might have in terms of their schedule, in terms of teaching schedules or, you know, commitments for, for, for other projects. Um, and at the, uh, when, when the process was done, 
there were um, uh, five uh, um, outside external uh, experts who brought, you know, independent experience to assist and support the DPS uh, staff team on it and um, worked uh, to, as I said, work to uh, support the understanding. And their expertise included, it, these were very, um, each, of, each of the five had significant expertise, you know, decades of experience um, across very targeted areas that um, we needed to look at, including relays, relay protections, uh, cables and joints, um, and breakers and transformers uh, that came from uh, uh, various uh, educational institutions, um, as well as um, uh, with private experience as well. Um, um, and uh, they provided great assistance to, um, uh, to the DPS team. So much, and I just wanna make clear, I don't have um, an issue if we determine that um, we do need um, outside help uh, on investigations um, to be able to figure out um, how to uh, uh, find them uh, and hire them. My concern really lies with the process of it because we want to make sure that we are um, not only being transparent to the process, but also ensuring that um, we are following um, a, a prudent um, process in those. You refer to them as independent experts, and I just want to push back a little bit because they aren't necessarily independent um, because they were um, hired to work with us, um, not give you know their own uh, independent um, uh, work product, et cetera. So you know, I think it would be fair to say that um, if an entity hired experts, they're those. Um, Though that entity's um, experts, and you couldn't say that they were independent from, um, you know, the, the the company that hired them, unless there was there's was more sort of um, guardrails on what that looked like. Is that fair to say? Um, I guess my take would be different, Commissioner Berman. Um, the the individuals, the five individuals, brought experience that was uh, independent from. Uh, um, staff, uh, they they had their own um, experience, their professional experience, either in academia or in um, consulting. You know, very uh, robust electrical engineering experience um, for uh, specific systems, structures, components, and also large electric systems, and uh, were able to um, uh, bring that uh, bring that to bear um, to support and to um, augment the, the uh, staff's experience. So I would say they were, you know, they were outside, external, and independent, and um, the process uh, benefited um, from them. It's a, um, uh, it's a process that is not, uh, I would say, unusual in, in you know, legal, um, in, in, in legal cases or in maybe, um, you know, business cases in general. So I, I, I hear, um, I, I certainly hear and, and uh, appreciate your comment. Um, at the end of the day, they um, were able to uh, support and augment the, uh, the staff's uh, investigation um, and, uh, and assist and, um, you know, and, and at the end of the, you know, at the end of the process or the, where we are now in the process, we do have, um, uh, you know, a, a pathway going forward, a potential pathway going forward, and we have the staff report as well. Right. Thank you. So uh, I appreciate that. I think we're probably, um, you know, slicing uh, the, the definition. You know, to me, uh, an independent consultant versus an employee versus someone who's truly independent. Um, these folks were hired uh, with the help of NIFA um, to work with the department staff on this investigation rather than to uh, work independently and give, um, you know, their own independent work. Um, so from my perspective, I know you and I have spoken about this, is that they, they're not technically independent as we might think of when we hire through 
the RFP process in management audits, um, an independent um, uh, outside auditor, uh, um, because in those cases, that process is, is fairly rigorous in terms of the commission being involved in, um, you know, uh, the RFP process as well as then, um, you know, uh, deciding which one is the right one to select um, and then them actually engaging um, you know in in their uh, work product uh, with the commission so I think it is a little different I do think that it's something for us to look at um, as we go into the future because I think um, it is helpful to ensure that we are properly providing the guardrails and also establishing the record on those folks who um, will be hired um, uh, as um, consultants, uh, consulting experts, um, and ensure that, um, you know, we, we have all the relevant information, uh, you know, and, and what exactly they're doing, who's, who's overseeing their work, et cetera. I have no um, problem again with that. I just uh, do think that using the term uh, independent experts is um, not necessarily um, the, the correct terminology since they were um, DPS's experts. Uh, and just for clarification purposes, my understanding is NIPA um, did not have any substantive role in this investigation. Is that correct? That is correct, Commissioner. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make that clear. Um, I, I'm going to, again, as I said, I'm going to save my comments uh, as it relates holistically on investigations to 303. Um, I appreciate it, and I, I thank you for um, uh, um, your sharing with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Berman. Uh, Commissioner Alisi. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, with your indulgence. I'm going to combine my statements uh, with 302 and the next item, which is 303 at the end of the 303 presentation. Okay, got it, thank you. Um, Commissioner Edwards. Thank you very much. Uh, the only thing I would say, Joe, is we've talked about speed of investigations, and I know that um, we've, We've done a lot of work. All of you have done a lot of work in order to do that. And that's why we're going to move to 303. Uh, so I think that whatever we can do to continue to do that uh, is absolutely uh, necessary. Uh, you know, we 84 corrective actions that are recommended uh, when you are losing any part of your service. Communication to customers is key providing accurate ETAs is absolutely appropriate. So I am uh, voting in favor of this item. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Commissioner Howard. Yeah, to me, this, uh, this case uh, falls in two distinct buckets. One dealing with the technical analysis of what went wrong and potential technical fixes uh, that will ensure that this won't happen in the future. The second part is dealing with communications. Um, I think it may be imperative going forward that we revisit how all utilities uh, communicate with their customer base uh, on a going forward basis. Uh, I know there was great emphasis on the lack of uh, press releases and the like. I think there are certainly more effective measures broadly how utilities can co uh, communicate with their customer base. And that I hope as we move forward in a constructive manner that we uh, have great emphasis on improving that in a way that is truly meaningful for customers and not just an exercise in, uh, you know, in, in, in issuing press releases and, and the like. So, but with that, I will be supporting it. Thank you very much. With that, uh, I will proceed to call for a vote. Uh, 
For the record, it's John Rhodes, and my vote is in favor of the recommendations to institute the proceeding to reconsolidate it as in to show cause as discussed. Mr. Berman, how do you vote? I concur. Thank you. Commissioner Lisi, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Edwards, how do you vote? I vote in favor. Thank you. And Commissioner Howard, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. The item is approved and the recommendation is adopted. We now move to the currently third item for discussion, item 303, case 20E0586, which is the department's investigation into the utilities preparation for and response to trop tropical storm Isaias in August 2020 of this year and the resulting electric power outages also presented by Joe Such. Kevin Wisely, Leka Jonai, Chief of Electric Safety and Reliability, and Rory Lanceman, Special Counsel for Rate Payer Protection, are available for questions. Joe, please begin. Thank you, Chair Rhodes and Commissioners. Item 303 is a proposed order commencing a proceeding at the show cause directing Consolidated Edison of New York Incorporated Orange and Rocky Utilities Incorporated and Central Hudson Gas and Electric Corporation to show cause why the commission should not commence a prudency proceeding or pursue civil penalties relating to their preparation for and response to the August 2020 tropical storm ICAs and related outages. Throughout this presentation, I will refer to these utilities individually as Con Edison, ONR, and Central Hudson and together as the subject utilities. Also, at the end of my presentation, I will ask my colleague, Rory Landsman, Special Counsel for Ratepayer Protection, to relay his forthcoming public measures to better understand how it impacts the customers and businesses. On August 4, 2020, Tropical Storm Isaias struck New York with 70 plus mile per hour wind gusts and heavy rains, causing extensive damage and 900,000 peak customer outages, largely in Hudson Valley, New York City, and Long Island regions. Con Edison had 333,000 customer outages that took eight days to fully restore. O&R had 189,000 customer outages that took seven days to fully restore. And Central Hudson had 116,000 customer outages that took four days to fully restore. Network telephone, cable, and internet service outages persisted even longer than the electric outages, as restoration of these services often follow the power, and in many circumstances require power to operate. Thousands of New Yorkers, already forced to work from home because of the COVID pandemic, lacked electric, telephone, cable, and internet service for extended periods of time, during which temperatures reached or exceeded 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The day of the storm, the department initiated an all hands on deck investigation to understand root causes and push for speedy restoration. Department management conducted site visits of some of the worst hit areas and department staff engaged in real time communications with utilities and municipal and regional leaders regarding the storm response. The department based on these initial observations, discussions, and efforts, was able to issue notices of apparent violations, or NOAV, on August 19, 2020, to, among others, Con Edison, ONR, Central Hudson, relating to their preparation for and response to tropical storm ICA. These NOAVs served two purposes. First, the NOAVs put the subject utilities on notice of apparent violations of the Public Service Law, or PSL, its regulations and commission-approved emergency response plans, or EOPs, noting, among other things, the subject utilities' apparent failures to properly staff for the storm. Second, the department required the subject utilities, as well as other utilities not served with NOAV, to implement a series of remedial actions to mitigate the impacts of future storms, most notably a requirement to increase storm staffing. 
At the same time, the NOAVs were issued. The governor requested the Department of Financial Services and its forensic team to support the department in its investigation. With this added support, the department committed to expedite its storm investigation from its typical one-year timing to less than six months. Only two days after the department issued NOAV, it began the second phase of its investigation. This next phase included, but was not limited to, conducting 43 utility employee and related party interviews and depositions, ranging from two to 14 hours each, submitting document preservation notices, requesting and later reviewing tens of thousands of emails and technical documents, meeting with regional, city, and town officials, reviewing hundreds of customer complaints submitted to the department, and analyzing utility submitted ERP scorecards and storm reports. The department's ability to investigate soon after the event when memories of involved parties were still fresh, combined with increased staffing and forensic support, ensured that investigation speed did not compromise thoroughness and attention to detail. In short, we followed the facts. The results of the department's investigation are memorialized in the department's ICAS storm report, which is provided to the commission contemporaneously with this proposed order. The proposed order also reflects the subject utilities' apparent violations of their ERPs identified in the investigation. These apparent violations relate to storm classification and staffing, call center staffing, call center response times, inadequate and untimely estimated times of restoration, inoperable website and outage maps, and the wholly unacceptable apparent failure to contact registered life support equipment customers. These apparent violations, if confirmed by the commission, would vary in penalty amount based on a statutory formula that can be summarized as follows. Con Edison, 33 apparent ERP violations, resulting in a potential penalty of up to approximately $102 million. O&R, 38 apparent ERP violations, resulting in a potential penalty of up to $19 million. Central Hudson, 32 apparent ERP violations, resulting in a potential penalty of up to $60 million. The proposed order also requires each subject utility to show cause why a prudency proceeding should not be commenced as to their actions and omissions relating to Tropical Storm Isaiah. Lastly, as to Con Edison and O&R, but not Central Hudson, should the Commission confirm any of the apparent violations in this proposed order, it may then, in combination with these utilities' other admitted or confirmed repeat violations of failing to provide safe and adequate service, commence a proceeding to consider the revocation or modification of Con Edison's and or o certificate to operate. In this respect, at the July session, the Commission approved a joint proposal, or JP, between Con Edison, o and and staff selling the order to show cause related to the 2018 Riley and Quinn storms, in which Con Edison and o and r each admitted to multiple violations of their EIPs. We also have the order to show cause on the 2019 Manhattan and Brooklyn outages, item 302, which is before the Commission today and further alleges ERP violations. I raise this to point out that a finding of repeat violations is a threshold issue of whether the commission may elect to commence a proceeding to consider the revocation or modification of Con Ed and or o and certificate to operate. The subject utilities have 30 days to respond to the proposed order. As such, the department recommends the commission adopt the proposed order commencing a proceeding and to show cause. I also note that the department, pursuant to its authority under PSL section 3B, provided the Long Island Power Authority, or LIPA, on November 13th, a letter summarizing the results of the department's review and recommend investigation of its service provider, PSAG Long Island, during Tropical Storm ICAS. The department will also provide LIPA with the ICAS storm report, which includes a PSAG Long Island technical review, 
after today's session. No action is required by the commission as to LIPA or PSEG Long Island. Further, the department's tropical storm ICAS telecommunications investigation is continuing. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your consideration. And on sincere behalf of the department, I'd like to thank Superintendent Linda Lacewell of DFS and her team, particularly Kevin Pawlowski and Allison Passa, along with Christian Bonga, Lori Cornelius, Nicholas Force, and Lucas McNamara of, DF of DPS for their tireless effort and support over the past three months. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Rory Lansman, after which the team is available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Good afternoon, Chair Rhodes, Commissioners. My name is Rory Lansman, the statewide special counsel for ratepayer protection appointed by Governor Andrew Cuomo. As you might know, I come to this position having previously served as a member of the state legislature and the New York City Council, where my focus was reforming the civil and criminal justice system for the benefit of ordinary people. The kind as a people I represented for 19 years as an active member of the New York Bar, protecting their employment rights and their safety. And I believe these are also the kinds of people that Governor Cuomo had in mind when he established this position and appointed me to it. Ordinary pe people who can't understand why their electricity takes so long to restore after bad weather, why their water bills are so high, why their kids can't access affordable high-speed internet. Tropical Storm Isaiah is just the latest example, and my colleague laid out a compelling case itemizing the utility company's numerous alleged failures and violations of the law. Given the extent of those failures and the penalties we are seeking, a thorough evidentiary record of the harm and damage inflicted on the public will be necessary. That will be my responsibility. As Mr. Such detailed, we know that 330,000 Con Edison customers lost power, some for as long as eight days. 189,000 Orange and Rockland customers, some for as long as a week. 116,000 Central Hudson customers, some for four days. And PSEG Long Island, which is not subject to this proceeding, but rather a sort of parallel one driven by LIPA, 645,000 customers lost power, some for eight days. When you consider that each customer is an entire household or business, that's well over 2 million New Yorkers who went without light, refrigeration, air conditioning, computer access, truly modern life's essentials. How did this harm children who couldn't access the internet for online learning or engagement? adults who couldn't telecommute and the businesses relying on them? How many hundreds of millions of dollars in productivity and economic activity were lost? For how many businesses was this outage the straw that broke the camel's back? How many seniors and other vulnerable populations were unable to access healthcare and social services they rely upon? How much additional strain did this put on our already overburdened healthcare workers and first responders? Were people who lost food and medicine and other goods properly reimbursed? It is important that all these voices be heard in this proceeding and that the commission consider the damage and harm caused to them if and when the time comes to assess sanctions. We intend to provide the commission with the evidence enabling you to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Rory, um, for that uh, helpful summary of your role in continuing the investigation, um, especially with the emphasis on assessing the uh, harm to customers. Um, I should note here that um, I have signed an authorization, authorization under Section 8 of the Public Service Law to give you the standing and authority to allow you to do just that. And also, thank you for joining and strengthening the team and positioning us to do even more to protect customers. Welcome. Um, with regard to this item, uh, 
we had tropical storm Isaias, and after that we experienced broad, extended, severe, severe, and an unacceptable level of outages, which were especially difficult for our fellow New Yorkers um, in our COVID uh, stress circumstances. Um, this item that uh, we have before us is the item, again, of a probing um, and careful, and this time swift investigation, very usefully and helpfully supported by the Department of Financial Services. Joe has discussed um, the output of, I guess, the first phase of the investigation, namely the NOAVs um, that uh, the team produced uh, and, and the staff issued on a very timely basis, um, important as we were still um, in the midst of hurricane season and exposed to the dangers that flow from that. And we're now at the next stage. As in the prior item, we now know in an evidence-based way, the nature and underlying causes of the failure. Um, and we know that the effect of these um, failures on customers was unacceptable. Um, the evidence of that failure is compelling, and it's time to act to ensure accountability. Um, I am going to be uh, in support of the item which drives us in that direction. Commissioner Berman. Thank you so much. Um, before um, I ask other questions, I think I would like to um, call upon Doris Stout again um, to talk a little bit about the Moody's analysis um, that was released uh, last week on Friday as it relates to the proposed legislation um, uh, that the governor put forward and has been introduced um, in the assembly and the Senate, I believe, uh, as it relates to uh, storm issues, uh, et cetera. So good, good afternoon, Commissioner Berman. Um, this is Doris Stout again. Um, a number of my comments uh, that applied to NYSEGA and rg and &E would apply in, in these circumstances as well. Um, when we try to assess what the impacts are of our actions on bond ratings, we have to look at both the quantifiable financial impacts and the non-quantitative non-quantifiable qualitative impacts of our actions on the perceived regulatory environment. So the financial impacts of the potential penalties under the order to show cause are generally viewed as one-time events. And oftentimes the rating agencies would just discount those because they're looking at a longer term impact in terms of um, analyzing the, the utilities financial metrics. What's more difficult to ascertain is that qualitative impact of the order to show cause. And as you mentioned, uh, Moody's has made some, some clear statements in their analysis that was issued on Friday and that uh, detailed the various developments in New York, including the legislation um, that have had um, negative credit implications over the past 12 months and also noted the impact of ESIES on, on their assessment. Um, S&P, I think I also mentioned earlier, um, that they still find New York is very credit supportive and they're monitoring those developments associated with um, the legislation. And so this is an important topic because our regulatory environment amounts to or accounts to um, about 50% of the rating agency's analysis of credit quality. Um, and so the determination of, of when that um, those concerns about regulatory environment um, might have an impact, again, it's going to depend on the existing ratings of the utilities and, and, and how well they are supported by their financial metrics within their rating category. So if a 
company is currently stable or if it, you know, it has strong financial metrics, it's less likely to be immediately impacted by a negative regulatory environment. But a number of the New York utilities have been flagged by Moody's um, and are on um, negative outlook. So additional actions um, like the legislation that they know and, and our actions on these orders to show cause could have um, additional uh, negative impact on, on their assessment of the bond ratings of the New York utilities. Um, all that being said, um, you know, as Joe Such detailed and the chair mentioned, um, these orders to show cause are built upon a very thorough analysis and it's a very methodical approach and the utilities have an opportunity to respond before the commission takes its, its final action. So, so those final actions are yet to come. This is just one stage in the analysis. And um, similar to what I said about NYSIG in our, our, our g and &E case, you know, while our stable and predictable regulatory environment is important, and strong bond ratings are important for being able to raise capital at reasonable rates. If utilities can't deliver safe and adequate service at just and reasonable rates, the commission may still have to take certain actions to enforce our regulations, or as they did in NYSIG rg &E, protect rate payers from the high rate increases in the extraordinary financial times that we're facing. So ultimately, um, similar to Nysignargini, you have to weigh and balance the long-term cost of a potential downgrade with the benefits of our actions. Thank you, Doris. That was very helpful. Um, I did listen yesterday to LIPA Board of Trustees meeting as they um, went over their 90-day report um, which was helped by um, the steering committee, which consisted of DPS um, uh, staff. Uh, and the thing that I was struck with was that the board of trustees asked many of the questions that I would have put forward to staff as it relates to um, what LIPA was doing and is doing, et cetera. And I, I do understand the nuances with LIPA and PSC and G Long Island and a different regulatory structure. However, I, I am um, struck by the fact that I do think that it would benefit um, ratepayers as a whole, whether they're um, PSC and G Long Island ratepayers or statewide uh, ratepayers under um, our jurisdiction for the commission uh, body as well as the board of trustees to engage in, in some fashion as appropriate um, to be able to facilitate better communication. I was struck that the PC, PC, uh, excuse me, that the LIPA um, uh, board members um, really were um, shocked uh, and said that they um, had lost trust in um, PSIG Long Island. Um, and I, I guess I'm, I, I look to the recommendations that had been put forward um, both by LIPA and DPS for some real specifics on perhaps um, better oversight of the LIFA board itself um, and also um, DPS and perhaps the commission as to um, the, uh, the, the things that need to be in place for better regulatory um, oversight that leads to um, uh, better compliance. Um, I think that that's something that we can all take to heart even as we sit here looking at this is what are we doing that may be better from a process perspective to help us in our regulatory oversight in a way that actually produces um, better results? Um, does seem like there's a there's a difference uh, significantly from the PSIG Long Island situation and the um, 
70 recommendations from DPS and I think 100 or so from um, LIPA and then, um, you know, a lesser number uh, in this situation, however, uh, still something for us to look at. I do also note that both of the reports for 302 and 303 seem to have been um, uploaded to DMM. So I do want to make it clear that we're not voting, I believe, we're not voting on those reports. Um, and while they were contemporaneously given to us with this draft order, um, and I thought they were getting released after and uh, if and when we uh, adopted the orders, I do want to just make clear that those reports are staff reports. Um, and that we are looking at it through the order to show cause process. Is that is that fair to say? Y yes, Commissioner, I think that's right on. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the other thing I was struck with was that PSIG, excuse me, I keep saying PSIG and LIPA, uh, focused on a tier approach where they were looking at the different um, recommendations uh, to be done that uh, were sort of, and I, I don't know that they use this wording, but um, uh, high priority, medium priority, low priority, and that we're looking at um, what was necessary in terms of a violation may have occurred, but it that wasn't necessarily um, uh, a problem to uh, whatever, and it didn't necessarily relate to um, uh, damage per se, uh, and we needing to look at um, making sure that we dealt with these uh, as appropriate in terms of how severe they were, um, not only at the time of the storm, but in terms of fixing. Um, and how does that sort of mirror what um, staff is doing in um, the cases before us? Well, I'll ask Kevin wisely of the OREP team to comment further, uh, Commissioner. As you know, uh, Kevin and I are on the LIPA report, uh, on the LIPA task force. Right. We have input into their report. Um, they have an understanding of what our, uh, our findings were as well, which we relayed to them both during the letter and, and verbally. Uh, so we're trying to sync our efforts while at the same time remain autonomous. We are having an autonomous report and so do they. Um, uh, their three-tiered approach seems to make sense to me, and they are looking at the highest risk first and trying to, to address those. And we support that in the sense that things such as the OMS and other, there could be a storm tomorrow. And because of that, they need to right away fix those issues right uh, in case there is an incoming storm. So I think we do support their, their tiered approach. Kevin, I'd ask you to comment further, please. Uh, sure, Joe, thank you. Um, and Commissioner Bourbon, yes, we uh, have followed that along and worked uh, uh, with them and uh, do follow their, their tiered approach. There are certain things that are much more important. As uh, uh, Joe articulated, the management system is uh, of utmost importance to uh, uh, rectify and have in, in service. Uh, the staff team will continue to um, review the findings that we have already documented and build and develop recommendations um, and those that are appropriate to um, be integrated into the emergency response plans. Um, we will ensure that that happens um, prior to uh, you know, presenting the, the next round um, of emergency response plans uh, at the beginning of the year. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I, I guess I'm also looking at it from the perspective that, you know, we have the LIPA report. DPS is also doing, uh, as LIPA indicated at its board meeting, um, it, its separate investigation as well. Um, and we heard from um, our newest member, Rory Lansman, and um, it's a pleasure um, to hear from him today. But I do think that it is important for us uh, to look sort of globally at all of the different activities that are going on uh, in an investigative way that doesn't um, trip over um, themselves, as well as provide critical feedback globally on some of these things. You know, I do note that um, Rory mentioned and the chair confirmed that um, he will be uh, um, following 
um, you know, looking to have an evidentiary record um, that looks at um, potential harm and damage um, on the public. And I guess I'm looking at that as, and, and mentioned sanctions, I guess I'm looking at that and I'm thinking that folks may be a bit confused on the different tracks of this investigation and where things are um, matching up and where there is overlap, um, but also to have some uh, finality, um, not just as the public engaged, um, but as uh, the, the necessary due process for the companies. So I think there needs to be a little bit more clarity on what this investigation process looks like, including now this new development of, it seems like a separate inquiry limited uh, on the side of um, pure damages or potential damages um, and what that may look like, especially if that means um, public hearings, you know, and especially with the sense of uh, the need for transparency, um, as well as um, uh, uh, the proper due process and proper scrutiny and um, following, um, uh, you know, a, a tight um, schedule, but also um, proper uh, uh, investigation protocols and um, ethics. So I just, you know, would, would look to flush that out um, as we go forward, because I do think that will be very important, especially as Doris spoke about the concerns that Moody had as to the proposed legislation. Some of those concerns could also be applied potentially to our future processes. And so I think that we need to be um, uh, very uh, focused on providing um, the certainty, especially as to the role of um, all these investigations and inquiries and the commission itself. Does that make sense? It does, Commissioner, Th and thank you um, for that. I, I, as you know, uh, I think the process going forth, um, at least in some aspects, is quite clear. So the subject utilities now, as you know, have 30 days to respond, which would be right. on or about 19 December or so. Uh, as well, the subject utilities may submit an NOIS, a Notice of Impending Settlement, to try and enter into settlement negotiations with department as respondents. Um, if those settlement uh, agreements cannot be reached, we would move to an evidentiary hearing. And as Doris said, this is simply a step in the process. That mm -hmm. process would provide due process to all parties uh, in colloquial terms to allow everyone to tell their side of the story. That would include um, uh, 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 how they see the events and their facts as compared to our facts. Uh, this would be before an objective tribunal in the sense of a uh, administrative law judge. And also um, that ALJ at some point would render a recommended decision for the department. Now, to match up with the other aspects, part of the penalties or part of the damages, which would be any, part of any analysis on if there were uh, penalties applied, would be where Rory would come in and both to the commission as well as the ALJ provide his testimony that he's collected. Um, secondly, as to making sure, and this is an important one, that we don't just follow the investigation path toward compliance, but we also tie off the remedial recommendations, which could be just as important. Uh, on 15 December, as you know, Better and I, we have the next set of ERP reviews by the department. Kevin Wisely and his team, and I don't wanna speak for him, Kevin Wisely and his team will be wrapping in lessons learned and best practices from this storm and from uh, item 302 uh, into those ERPs. Kevin, any, anything further on the ERP section? No, Joe, that's right. As you articulated, we, you know, and as I mentioned uh, earlier, we will be looking at identifying those um, corrective actions and recommendations that will be um, made part of the emergency response plan review um, and uh, authorization as we move forward. Thank you. Yeah, um, uh, I, I did speak to um, Joe beforehand about, you know, the sort of the balance in this enforcement and also that our, our goal is really to drive uh, uh, compliance and improve uh, performance 
uh, it does mean that we also have to look at ways that we ourselves can uh, do better. Um, but since many of these public policy decisions um, as to what to do to improve um, uh, you know, performance in storms, as it gets driven into the ERPs, um, as, as well as the scorecards, which I know LIPA has been focused on, but we don't fr frankly seem to focus on the scorecards um, publicly at least. Uh, it does drive um, costs, uh, especially when you talk about needing more staff and needing um, more um, mutual aid, et cetera. So we really do need to be mindful of that right balance um, and, and look at that carefully because, um, you know, we will see uh, a, a potential increase in the need uh, for rate impacts. So it's something for us to be cognizant of. Um, I, I, I am uh, I am wrapping up. I thank you so much for um, this. Um, I am just um, making sure folks know that I, I see this as also for us to look at, um, you know, helping to set the tone uh, in a way that moves us forward um, with uh, a better performance uh, across the board, but also, in light of the fact that we have um, different entities involved, we have uh, LIPA, PSEG Long Island, you know, that um, LIPA board was discussing uh, and putting a lot of blame on PSEG New Jersey. Um, and, um, you know, I find it sort of, I, I just want to make sure that we are not comparing apples to oranges as it goes for the utilities that we're looking at. And that means that we really do have to get under the hood as a commission on um, the recommendations and analysis over on PSIG uh, Long Island. But New Jersey's um, electric utilities in the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities, they just issued a report yesterday. And my quick read on it um, was that they found that the New Jersey electric utilities, um, even though there was wide, widespread power outages, um, that the performance was ex was acceptable. Um, and uh, I, I would just like to see sort of an analysis and comparing, um, you know, sort of performance and also um, our own uh, regulatory scrutiny when we look at that. So um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Alisi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I will be succinct, um, not because I don't have a lot to say, but I think in fairness, uh, we are at the 50 yard line. There's uh, more to see in the upcoming months. Uh, but we'll be looking at, uh, at that in an environment where we already know that there have been historic failures. Uh, and uh, over the history of those failures, uh, fines have been levied, fines have been paid, penalties have been paid. And yet we see time and time again, uh, the failure to deal with the known causes of many of these failures. It could go down the list, overgrowth, uh, lack of preventive maintenance, uh, not enough seasonal staff, a weak mutual aid systems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think uh, that as we add uh, resources uh, coming from the state, uh, to look into these and uh, consider significant changes that uh, uh, we quit with history in mind and knowing that the future has to be different than what we've seen in the past. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Edwards? Uh, yes, you know, my um, comments actually are to uh, Rory. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, and uh, welcome. You know, I was struck by what you said, and I just want to either clarify or add to, you know, because when you, I was struck by what you said that assessing harm to customers and looking out for everyday customers and business is going to be your job. It's all of our jobs. You know, I um, can consistently go back to the mission of ensuring affordable, safe, and secure service 
And nowhere in there does it say sometimes. Uh, nowhere in there does it say except in a storm. Uh, so with your added uh, role to help us strengthen that process uh, will be is well needed and, and it's uh, it's welcome. But you're part of us as a whole. And I uh, just want to make sure that we keep our eye on ensuring that all of us are responsible for for that. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I look forward to working with you. You too. Thank you um, both. Um, and Commissioner Howard. Yeah, just a, <clears throat> a couple of questions and then some comments. Much of the, the report, particularly in dealing with Con Ed O&R, focuses on weather forecasting. Uh, again, uh, in conversation with staff and my own personal history, we know that this is less than precise. So as we go forward, the, I, I guess this is a question will be in a, something that Commissioner Berman alluded to is how much preparation at what cost? Um, for instance, if we come out of this proceeding and with a more gold-plated and much more expensive system that will deal with a, I don't want to say completely rare, but uh, not constant problems that we don't overpay. And there's a question particularly in the regard, to, uh, I'll just make the comment in the report regarding the Con Ed meteorologist indicated there was a 50-50 chance of, of major damage to be had by this storm system. The question becomes, what is a prudent guess? Because that's what forecasts are in many cases, a guess. Is it 50-50, we go uh, full ball or in preparation, or is it 20%? And at what point uh, is that correct balance? because we know that it will not be free. Uh, second of all, as I'll say this as someone who's lived in rural New York my entire life, there, I think we have now had an increasing expectation on customers that no matter where you live in our state, that your reliability will be the same as those in a much more uh, urban environment uh, with uh, better protected systems. Um, again, I think a lot will go to communication to uh, elected leaders and such to, to actually explain how restoration works, particularly on the triage and how uh, the system is designed to do the most customers the quickest. And I think that uh, we will have to understand that, hopefully understand that uh, all customers in a very leafy rural environment, uh, by definition, cannot expect the same level of service as someone in uh, inner city. Uh, <clears throat> but that being said, I think there are a lot of questions here. And the outcome needs to be not only how we're going to make this corrected and compensate customers for bad behavior, but also with an eye on what the remedy will be and how much it will cost in the end. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will now proceed to call for a vote. Um, for the record, it's John Rhodes. And my own vote is in favor of the recommendations to commence a proceeding and direct the utilities to show cause as discussed. Commissioner Berman, how do you vote? I concur. Thank you. Commissioner Lisi, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Edwards, how do you vote? I vote yes. Thank you. Commissioner Howard, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. The item is approved and the recommendation is adopted. We will now move to the consent agenda. Do any commissioners wish to comment on or recuse from voting on any items on the consent agenda beginning with uh, Commissioner Berman. Thank you. I have three short uh, comments and a different vote from uh, voting yes on the consent agenda. 
um, on item 266, which is in the matter of green light networks, pole attachments in uh, rg and &E and Frontiers territory. Um, I am going to be voting uh, uh, in concurrence, but I do want to say that this may be, I think this is a wider problem than just this company, Greenlight Networks, and the utilities involved here. Um, broadband deployment expansion and um, access, uh, especially for uh, low-income uh, folks, is important. Um, safety is paramount. And we need to be sure that these attachments statewide on any polls are safe and accounted for. Um, I truly appreciate the hard work of, that staff has done, but I do believe that more work needs to be done. And I also believe this is not just a telecom uh, issue or matter, but really it is also an electric um, matter uh, and it can have impacts on helping to mitigate rates of the electric customers, especially when we are accounting for uh, these pole attachments. So would like to make sure that we are laser focused um, on this issue and in a way that is helping to uh, resolve the issues um, in, in a way that, that is helpful to um, uh, the consumers. On item 375, which is the uh, petition for rehearing on the village of Freeport, I will be abstaining um, uh, from voting. On item 376, um, this is the uh, petition that was filed by NYSERDA to allow for voluntary conversion of the existing fixed uh, renewable energy credit contracts to index REX contracts. Um, and suggest that the draft order uh, is approving with modifications. Um, I am going to be voting no on this item. It's consistent with some of the other issues I have raised um, on NYSERDA petitions as a whole, but as to index RECs. I also do think that when we are talking about um, how uh, the commission voted on other items, especially referencing, um, I, in this case, uh, the index RECs and the rationale behind them, I do think it is incumbent upon um, staff to uh, share with the commissioners um, before they're voting, um, my comments or anyone's comments that may have been made at a session uh, related to um, uh, the items. Um, you know, I had uh, voted uh, differently and raised some concerns on index recs. I think that um, could have been um, teed up in a way that would have been helpful and also would have laser focused all of us on the importance of uh, what we may or may not be doing. I will note that there are commenters that did raise concerns um, in here, uh, the joint utilities for one, um, and, uh, and the multiple interveners. And I do think that those comments are really important. I am concerned that this petition really um, is with rose-colored glasses and um, speculative and not truly focused on potentially negative outcomes that could um, harm uh, ratepayers. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to really um, look carefully at this and um, not just um, go along with this without some more. They do not provide any um, thing other in my mind other than real lip service on uh, this is um, this is a one-time thing and should be helpful um, I think we need more than that thank you thank you very much Commissioner Berman just to confirm you're a no on 376 and abstaining on 375 correct thank you very much um, Commissioner Lisi, any comments or refusals? Uh, yes, I'll uh, be supporting the non-controversial calendar. With the exception of item 266, I would like to recuse myself. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Edwards, any recusal or comment? Yes, I will be supporting the consent agenda, but would like to recuse myself on item number 375. Thank you very much. And Mr. Howard, uh, sorry, Commissioner Howard, 
Um, any comments or recusals? Yes, I uh, on one item, item 263, um, <clears throat> I will be voting no. Um, as we've discussed, uh, Mr. Chairman, I've become increasingly skeptical on our AMA, AMI programs. Uh, I believe um, they are not providing the promises to date that uh, we expected. So uh, again, I will be voting no on item 263 and supporting the balance of the consent agenda. Thank you very much. Um, so I will proceed to call for a vote. For the record, my own vote is in favor of the recommendations on the consent agenda um, with no amendments. Commissioner Berman, uh, how do you vote? Noting your abstention on 375 and no on 376. Uh, correct, and on 266, I'm a concurrence. I just want to make clear that I am a yes on all others. On 375, I'm abstaining, not recusing. I'm abstaining. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Um, and uh, Commissioner Alisi, um, how do you vote? Noting your recusal on 266? That's correct. I vote yes on everything. I'm recusing myself on 266. Thank you very much. And uh, Commissioner Edwards, noting your recusal on 375, how do you vote? Yes on all other items. Thank you very much. And uh, Commissioner Howard, noting your no vote on the DIMO AMI, um, how do you vote on the rest of the consent agenda? I will be supporting the balance of the consent agenda. Thank you very much. And the items are approved and the recommendations are adopted. Secretary Phillips, is there anything further to come before us today? Um, yes, Chair, I just have one clarification. For Commissioner Berman, I should note concurrence on 266 and yes on everything else except for 375, which you're abstaining, and 376, which is a no, is that correct? That's correct for the consent agenda item. Thank you. With that, I have nothing further. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for, um, thank you commissioners for paying such, uh, for serving so well today, very serious. Um, and thank you staff. Um, uh, you've, uh, you've really done great work once again. Um, uh, thank you all. With that, we are adjourned and um, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you.